Replication is the duplication of DNA. In eukaryotic cells, this occurs well before mitosis and cell division. In prokaryotes, like bacteria, replication is concurrent with growth and cell division. In this module, we'll be reminded of how the structure of DNA lends itself to hypotheses for replication that were essentially correct, and we'll look at the details of the process itself. Recall that Griffith discovered that live cells could pick up genetic information from dead ones, a process he called transformation. Avery and company quickly showed that the transforming principle or transforming molecule was DNA, and then Hershey and Chase showed that the genetic molecule of viruses was also DNA. When Watson and Crick unraveled the structure of DNA and proposed the double helix, the complementary relationship of the antiparallel strands of DNA led them to propose that DNA replication was, in fact, semi-conservative. This was tested formally by Messelson and Stahl and shown to be correct. Theoretically, there were three possible models for how a double helix could replicate. All involved the separation of the complementary DNA strands. At the left is conservative replication, in which the parental double strand is indeed conserved. In the middle is semi-conservative replication, in which parental strands each combine with a new daughter strand. Though thought unlikely, the dispersive model shown at the right was at least a possibility to be considered, and here it is. Messelson and Stahl had access to nitrates made with heavy nitrogen, or N15. They grew cultures of E. coli in media containing the heavy nitrogen, and after several generations, all of the DNA in the cells was heavy DNA, shown as blue strands to the right here. Then, cells were transferred to medium containing normal or light nitrogen, N14, and allowed to grow for one generation. For each replication model, they could predict what kind of DNA would be replicated, as illustrated here. They would see either 100% middleweight DNA or two distinct kinds of DNA in equal proportions. And here are those predictions. Messelson and Stahl did the experiment and extracted DNA from the first generation of cells. If the cells produced a 50-50 mix of heavy and light nitrogen double helices, they would be able to separate them by a technique called density gradient centrifugation, a fact that they had previously demonstrated. Uh, do you know that technique? Look it up so that you do know it. The cells, in fact, contained 100% middleweight DNA, that is an equal combination of light and heavy nitrogen labeled DNA that behaved as if it was all of one density. So that eliminated the conservative model of replication. That left the semi-conservative and dispersive models of replication. The dispersive model was eliminated by carrying this experiment out to a second generation of growth on the light nitrogen isotope. Now, can you explain why? All right, now that we know that replication is semi-conservative, it was time to identify the enzyme that catalyzed the process. It was possible to make predictions about this putative enzyme. First, it should require a template that is one of the two strands of a double helix from which it would synthesize a complementary strand using nucleotide precursors. Here's Arthur Kornberg's experiment in which a DNA-dependent DNA polymerase was first detected. DNA was extracted from E. coli cultures and then heated to denature the double helical DNA. The single-stranded DNA was then mixed with four deoxynucleotide triphosphates and added to an E. coli lysate that was prepared simply by bursting open the cells from a different culture. One of the deoxynucleotides in this case was radioactive so that any DNA that was synthesized, even if only a small amount, could be detected as large radioactive molecules. After incubating this mixture for a while, the DNA was extracted and separated by size. This is a cartoon of a separation that might have been done using a size separating resin shown in a column in gray here, and material coming out of the bottom of the column in the size order shown. The different size fractions, that is these test tubes, of DNA were collected and analyzed to see which were radioactive or if any were radioactive. And sure enough, large radioactive molecules had been made. This DNA was extracted and then hydrolyzed back down to nucleotide monomers. 
And when the base composition of this extracted DNA was determined, it showed that the newly made DNA had the same proportion of A, G, C, and T as the parental E. coli DNA. Kornberg concluded that the bacterial lysate contained a polymerase with the expected properties. Kornberg further analyzed his polymerase and showed that the enzyme was about a thousand amino acids long and it was present at about 400 copies per cell. He also showed that his bacterial lysates or his purified enzymes could catalyze DNA synthesis using DNA from different species as a template. But there was a problem. Mutants of E. coli were found that grew slowly but still had normal levels of this polymerase. And still other mutants that had unusually low levels of this polymerase were found that grew at normal rates. In this graph, the increase in the number of cells is plotted against time. The control or wild type curve has appeared first. The growth curve for the slow growing mutant with normal levels of polymerase appears next. And the curve for the polymerase deficient mutant that nevertheless grew at normal rates appeared last. The conclusion had to be that another DNA polymerase was responsible for most of the replication of DNA in the bacterium. Arthur Kornberg's son Thomas was the one who worked out the characteristics of two faster acting DNA polymerases than the one his father had discovered. The three E. coli enzymes are compared in this slide. They're called Pol1, Pol2, and Pol3 for short. Pol1, Father Kornberg's polymerase, was the slow acting one at 400 copies per cell. And as you'll see, it has a function in DNA replication related to a repair feature. DNA polymerase 2 was much faster acting. There were, however, a tenth the number of copies of this enzyme per cell. We now know, after many years of looking around, that this DNA polymerase in E. coli is also involved in repair mechanisms when DNA is incorrectly replicated. And DNA polymerase 3, the one with the asterisk, turns out to be the main polymerase of replication in E. coli. Biochemists soon determined most of the catalytic mechanism of DNA polymerase, and perhaps not surprisingly, most of these activities turn out to be the same for all DNA polymerases. Not only the ones in E. coli, but the ones subsequently isolated from many different uh, eukaryotic as well as prokaryotic cells. So all DNA polymerases require a DNA template. They cannot start catalysis of new strand synthesis without a template. It also turns out that all DNA polymerases require a primer, that is a short pre-existing strand on which to add new nucleotides. All known DNA polymerases cannot begin a new DNA strand from a single nucleotide. And of course, all DNA polymerases build new DNA from deoxynucleotide triphosphate precursors. A technique for visualizing E. coli chromosomes both confirmed semi-conservative replication and illuminated new replication riddles. So let's look at the E. coli chromosome. John Cairns in Scotland hit on the idea that if he allowed E. coli cells to grow on medium containing a radioactive nucleotide, in this case tritiated thymidine or H3 thymidine, the cells would make radioactive DNA which he could then visualize by a technique known as electron microscope autoradiography. Here's how it was done. Cells were incubated with the thymidine for several generations so that all the cells eventually contained radioactive DNA. The incubated cells were caused to lyse slowly in a dialysis bag. The slow lysis prevented damage to the DNA and lysis was done in a dialysis bag because DNA sticks to cellulose, which old-fashioned dialysis bags were made of. So after the radioactive DNA stuck to the walls of the dialysis bags, Cairns emptied the bag and cut the casing into small pieces. He placed the small pieces on an electron microscopy grid. He then poured melted film emulsion on the casing on the grids. Now film emulsion is the light or radiation sensitive stuff that coats traditional photographic film. After sufficient time for exposure, the casing with the emulsion on the electron microscope grid was developed, just like real film would be developed. And the image, called an autoradiograph, could be seen in the electron microscope. This slide illustrates what Cairns saw. The black dots are grains of silver that were exposed and developed in the emulsion. 
there were some circular arrays of dots and some circles with attached, call them partial circles. And Cairns realized that he was looking at silver tracks exposed by the E. coli DNA lying under the emulsion. Remember that all the DNA was radioactive. Now, microbiologists had already provided evidence that the chromosome of E. coli was in fact a closed circular DNA molecule. But this was visual proof of what was until then an abstract understanding. Cairns measured the circumferences of these various circles and he found that what he would call complete circles that show up in blue or red here always measured 1.36 nanometers in circumference consistent with the length expected for a double-stranded DNA molecule containing 4 million nucleotides or 2 million nucleotide pairs or base pairs. And that was consistent with a measured 0.044 picograms of DNA per E. coli cell. So it's quite clear that this is a visual manifestation of an E. coli chromosome. Cairns called these chromosomes theta images because they looked like variations of the Greek letter theta. In this slide, we see his interpretation of a series of theta images as E. coli chromosomes in different stages of replication. He arranged the images to show DNA growing longer off an original circular DNA molecule, eventually separating into two circles, each of which was 1.36 nanometers in circumference, in other words, two E. coli circular chromosomes. To explain how the replication of a circular chromosome began, he postulated an origin of replication, a single point at which the double helix would begin to unwind so that each strand could be replicated by DNA polymerase. We know now that the origin of replication, or OR, in E. coli is a specific short base sequence in the chromosome called ORIC. It's the job of that sequence to recognize proteins and enzymes that participate in unwinding the DNA at the origin of replication. An origin of replication begs the following question. Does replication proceed in one or in both directions from a point of unwinding from an origin? This slide illustrates the alternatives. In one alternative, DNA is replicated towards a single replication fork, or RF. And in the other alternative, after pulling the two strands apart at the origin of replication, new DNA is synthesized towards two replication forks. Another Scotsman, David Prescott, did the experiment that distinguished between unidirectional and bidirectional replication. Cultures of E. coli were exposed to a low concentration of tritiated thymine for a few seconds, and then to a higher concentration of the radioactive precursor for another few seconds, before the cells were lysed in a dialysis bag. The sum total exposure time was only a, a fraction of the E. coli generation time. The idea was that DNA synthesized in the first short time period would only be mildly or lightly radioactive and the DNA synthesized during the second time period would be much more heavily radioactive. The dialysis bag in which the cells were lysed was emptied and then the pieces cut placed on grids covered with emulsions and exposed and developed and then examined in the same manner as Cairns did in his experiment. This slide shows the alternative expectations. For unidirectional replication, lighter silver tracks extend from the origin of replication, the OR on the left here, until the point at which the higher concentration of tritiate thymidine was added to the cultures, after which there would be a much more dense silver tract. A schematic showing the whole chromosome is shown at the right. For bidirectional replication, the lighter silver tracks would be flanked by darker ones since the new and more radioactive DNA would have been synthesized in both directions after the DNA began unwinding at the origin of replication shown here in the middle of this image. Prescott saw images very like the illustration for bidirectional replication. Now, I indicated at the start of this discussion of how we visualize E. coli chromosomes that these techniques allowed us to confirm semi-conservative replication. So think about how you would make that explanation. Here's a representation of how linear chromosomal DNA of eukaryotes undergoes bidirectional replication from multiple origins of replication. An origin of replication forms a replicon with two replication forks. 
Multiple origins of replication start unwinding at different locations at different times, forming replicons, each of which replicates bidirectionally, and eventually all the replicons meet to form a complete daughter DNA double strand. Since single eukaryotic chromosomes can have 25 to 50 or more times the amount of DNA of a bacterial cell, it's clear that multiple origins of replication ensure that all the DNA in a chromosome is replicated on time. That is, during the 8 hours or less, or 10 hours or less, of the S phase of a eukaryotic cell cycle. In the next voiceover module, we'll continue looking at replication, this time focusing on the molecular details, and resolving replication riddles involving DNA synthesis activities at the replication fork. And that brings us to the end of this presentation.